Hello, welcome to the Friday, December 17th, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Brad today has news about the contact forms campaign. Uh, this campaign is particularly tricky in that it does send messages using a company's contact form. So the message will arrive like any other message submitted via your contact form that you may have on your website. And it then includes a threat that, well, there is some kind of copyright infringement going on in your organization with a link where you can download evidence of this infringement. And as usual, uh, this malware campaign also likes a good Google's cloud services, in this case, storage.googleapis.com. Multiple of these documents are hosted on googleapis.com and it usually takes quite a while for them to be removed, if ever. The file downloaded is an ISO file. If you open it, you are only seeing by default a document icon that points to what looks like, at least based on the file name, evidence of whatever activity you're being accused of. But it's actually a link and there are two hidden files in this directory. One is a JavaScript file, one is a DLL. And if you're clicking on the link, then uh, these files are being executed. So a couple tricks here that are being used uh, to get the user to execute the malware. First of all, it does not arrive as a normal email, but it arrives via a contact form. So that usually means it's a little bit more trusted than just a random email. The legal threat, of course, may help. And uh, then it uses a well-known, often trusted a domain, googleapis.com. And the icons don't necessarily give away that you're actually executing software as you're clicking and trying to open this file with evidence. PCAPs, malware samples, and more can as usual be found in Pratt's uh, diary from today. And then we got an interesting new group of attacks against wireless chips. Now, uh, before you get too excited about wireless vulnerabilities, the threat model here is a little bit limited in the sense that it sort of assumes that an attacker already has control over one wireless chip on a platform and is now trying to laterally move to another wireless system. The overall architecture here is that on systems that implement multiple wireless protocols, you may, for example, have distinct circuitry to implement Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and then possibly LTE or 5G protocols. But these distinct components are sharing resources like, for example, antennas. And because it is somewhat assumed that some of these components may have vulnerabilities and there are plenty of examples where these sort of systems on a chip that are often being used here have had vulnerabilities in the past, part of the security architecture here also assumes that these components are isolated from each other and also isolated from the operating systems, hoping to limit the chances of actually escalating privileges after an attacker, for example, took over one of uh, these components. But with all the isolation due to some of the shared components, uh, there needs to be some communication between these components. And there is actually an IEEE standard 802.15.2 that allows for a coexistence interface that will arbitrate access to, for example, antennas, frequencies, and the like. In this just published paper from researchers at the University of Darmstadt, as well as the University of Brescia, they outline a number of different vulnerabilities in implementations from Broadcom, Cypress, and Silicon Labs, which are really sort of the big uh, developers of uh, this kind of hardware. One of the vulnerabilities, for example, would allow an attacker who has access to the Bluetooth component to read Wi-Fi passwords from the Wi-Fi chip. Also, possibilities to manipulate traffic being sent by the other component. And then, of course, there are some denial of service vulnerabilities, which, in my opinion, are always a little bit less interesting for wireless devices, which usually are relatively easy uh, to uh, overwhelm with traffic. 
And Lenovo published an advisory regarding its uh, Lenovo system interface foundation and a vulnerability in the IM controller does allow local privilege escalation. IM controller comes pre-installed on a number of uh, Lenovo systems and it's responsible for performing system configurations and maintenance tasks. So that's why it does run with system privileges. The vulnerability is one of these a typical time of check and time of use vulnerabilities. So IAM controller starts a child process. The child process may load a plugin. It checks whether or not the plugin is signed by Lenovo. Then an attacker could swap it out uh, before it's actually being loaded. Updates are available from Lenovo. Not sure what the implications are of just uninstalling the Lenovo system interface foundation. And then just a quick update on Log4j. Well, we got updates from SAP now. They updated 20 of their apps. So take a look if you're using SAP. Also, there is a good list of vulnerable applications that CISA came out with that allows you to check for, I think it's literally more than 100 or so applications, what the current status is, whether they're vulnerable or not. Good discussion with a listener, uh, Michael, regarding some of the differences between uh, Log4j 215 and 216, whether or not uh, 216 just patches the denial of service vulnerability or whether it also does patch some data leakage or uh, code execution issues that were left in the initial uh, patch, in the 215 patch. Not really clear after rereading the advisories here, uh, what's the case. Uh, so best guess is stick to 216 if you can. And as far as exploits go, the targets being attacked certainly becomes more diverse. Uh, we did pick up now some attempts, for example, to use the JNDI strings as usernames as people logged into Telnet, SH servers, and such. And of course, it's fair to assume that user names like this will be logged and possibly will end up in log4j. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you again on Monday. Now, next week, there is sort of the uh, Christmas holidays starting. I'll probably do four podcasts uh, next week. So Monday through Thursday. If there's not much happening, then I may skip the Thursday podcast. Thanks and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.